nothing is really complex. I mean, people make things out to be complex, but the, the principles that drive transactions are almost always very simple. So one of the things we did on that transaction, we focused on the simple pieces of commerce um, and we could see a way home by doing that. You are listening to the Property Developer Podcast, your home for tips, ideas, and inspiration to help take your developing to the next level. Now here's your host, Justin Getty. Hello and welcome to episode 52 of the show. I trust you all well. I'm doing fine. I'm looking forward to bringing you another awesome guest on today's show, a 40-year veteran who runs a multi-billion dollar company. Before we get to that, here's a little of what I've been up to. So council has issued a notice of decision on my townhouse project, following some changes that were made to the scheme that we took to advertising. We ended up removing one unit and increased some of the setbacks and added five additional visitor car spaces beyond what we were required to provide to allow for more on-site car parking. Now we wait 28 days to see if anybody will appeal the decision. On my other project, we met with council to discuss their preferred new alignment for the front driveway of the development. It hasn't been quite as straightforward as I expected, as the existing crossover meets a main road near a T-junction, and council was not happy about additional cars turning out onto the road at that point. So they've come up with their preference for where the driveway should run, and we are working to make that happen, even though I don't really agree with it. It has highlighted an interesting point though, in that the driveway crossover is covered by council bylaws, not planning controls. So basically council decides where the driveway goes, and they have the final say, and it can't be appealed to any planning tribunal. Anyway, in the grand scheme of a development project, it is not a big deal, so we just move on. There are certainly bigger issues to resolve on this project. On another front, I've been reminded of the importance of selling the sizzle and not the sausage while advertising to sell one of my cars. I chose to tell a bit of a story with my ad copy, sharing my experience of the car, rather than focusing on the functionality of it, which 99% of other ads seem to do. I wanted to create an emotional connection with the vehicle, and I've been overwhelmed with the response from it. So it goes to show that you can stand out in a crowded market with a bit of thought and creativity. And before we get to today's guest, remember if you are interested in learning how to develop property, then email me, justin at propertydeveloperpodcast.com to find out about the mentoring program that is available to help you get started on your journey to becoming a successful property developer. You may turn out to be the next person that we are going to interview today, which is Don O'Rourke, the Executive Chairman of Consolidated Properties Group. Consolidated is one of Australia's leading development companies with a current workbook of more than $2 billion. It is a privately owned company that has delivered more than 200 projects over the last 35 years and is at the forefront of creating places that people love to live, work and shop. As a founding member of the company, Don has successfully shaped the business over the past three decades and he was only 23 when he knocked together his first commercial deal. This was a fascinating conversation as we look back over the many significant projects that have shaped the company, starting with a small commercial project in suburban Brisbane. Don shares his insight into how they did it, what they learned, and how things have changed with property developing over the decades. Don was very generous with his time, so this ended up being a long chat, so I've broken it up into two parts. Part one covers the watershed projects that have helped catapult the business into bigger things, And part two covers many of the lessons and tips that Don has learnt along the way. In this part, keep an ear out for how Don looks to put deals together, how he did a major deal with the Commonwealth at age 26, and what he does to manage risk. So I started off by asking Don what food he would eat until he was sick, and I was completely surprised by his response. Oh, that would be something from a very expensive restaurant and it would be the richest item on the list. Say, crumbed lamb's brains from um, from the uh, Montrachet restaurant in King Street in Brisbane. 
<laughs> You're uh, a man straight after my father's heart. That's uh, a dish that he'd go for as well. I'm probably the same age as your father, Justin, so it goes with the generation. Yes, I grew up uh, having that stuff made for breakfast for me from time to time. <laughs> Along with lamb's fry and bacon, that might be something you're familiar with too. Absolutely. I'm on that same program. <laughs> now, I um, understand that you're also a keen surfer. Is that true? Yes, I am, Justin. Um, yeah, I've surfed all my life. And um, as you get older, happily, technology and an abundance of foam assists me to stay in the water and on waves. So you're still surfing? I do, I do, yeah. I, I try and get down to the Gold Coast um, once every couple of weeks, but, um, you know, as things get busier uh, with family and work, my surfing time tends to be concentrated on uh, trips I do up to Indonesia to the islands of Sumatra. So I do that once a year and I get a, a really big hit um, of water time in a, in a concentrated sort of two-week period. And so where's your, where's your favourite break then? The last couple of years we've gone to um, a, a little land camp called Tello Lodge, which is in the Tello Islands in the northern part of the Mentaway Islands um, off the west coast of Sumatra. Um, that would have to be my favourite spot of late. Um, you know, perfect Indonesian reef waves, a little camp that only um, sleeps eight people, and 20 waves within 20 minutes um, by Tinny from that camp. So really good setup, really good waves, and no crowds. And what about, you grew up in Brizzy, didn't you? So you must have a break closer to town that you used to ride a lot. Yeah, yeah. So um, so locally, my favourite break is the beach break down at Casuarina Beach, which um, was a project we did well, we just finished, we did it over the last 20 years. Um, so I know a lot of the people that live in Casuarina and I've got quite a few friends there. So the go-to is normally um, down there, someone will have done a scout where the waves are working and normally we either surf the beach break, beach break out the front at Casuarina. If it's a bit bigger, we go down to Cabarita and surf the headland. If the wind's blowing from the north, we surf the back beach at the headland of Caparita. So that's sort of an hour and a quarter drive from Brisbane, so it's pretty handy. So you didn't get them to manufacture a break for you off Casuarina while you were developing it? No, but I had actually surfed um, in the Kelly Slater wave pool in Lemoore in California um, with Kelly, in fact. Kelly was there the weekend I was over there. Um, I have um, I had have been up until recently a director of Surfing Australia, which is the organisation that oversees the sport of surfing. And I went over with the chair, Lane Beachley, the CEO and the coach of the Olympic team to surf that wave. And, and I'm happy to report that uh, the Kelly Slater Wave Pool Company is going to do one of those facilities uh, in Australia in the next couple of years. So... Um, be very happy to see that, Justin, because it's a fantastic, uh, fantastic wave and a fantastic experience. Oh, it'll be good for people that are a bit short on time. They can duck down to the centre and grab a few waves. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the waves, one a minute, all day, every day. So, uh, yeah, it makes life easy. And what sort of board are you jumping on these days or do you like to jump on? Well, let's say, Justin, foam is our friend, so uh, or my friend, so... My boards are now 40 litres. To put that in context, um, the young pros are riding 25 litres, so my board is twice as thick as theirs. Um, so I'm riding um, a 6.3, and um, it's shaped by um, Matt Violas, who's the guy that's got lost surfboards. He shapes under the name of Mayhem. So, so yeah, 6.3 um, and set up for a quad or, or a thruster. Ah, so you're, you're kind of built for comfort these days, not speed. 40 litres gets me on those waves early. <laughs> well, we'll uh, it's good to know that you've got an interest outside of developing, but we're here today to talk about your developing career, which is quite significant. I think you've been involved in the game for 35 or 40 years. Can, yeah. you, can you tell us yeah. how you got started? Yeah, well, it's, it's our 40th year in business next year, Justin, so it's a bit of a landmark year for us in um, 2019. Um, I did a, a business degree majoring in marketing, and my first job 
was doing leasing at what is now CBRE. Um, while we're, we were doing, while, while I was working in the leasing department, we were looking after tenants like Westpac and finding for them new office premises or new um, retail premises. And I sort of thought, why do we get these ideas and then take them to the developer? We take the tenant and the site to a developer. I thought, we can probably cut the middleman out here. Um, so while I was at CBRE, we put under uh, option a site, uh, which we ultimately had a, uh, a design done, and, uh, and we built a little office building for Westpac at Lutwich. So my first project was done while I was still at CBRE in partnership with a couple of the guys that worked there. Um, so that was really the start of Consolidated Properties. Um, and, and really, we've done pretty much the same thing as that for the last 40 years. We've focused on the occupant of the property and we've looked to meet their needs. And if we do that successfully, uh, a financial transaction will emerge that is viable. And how did you get into leasing? For, how did you move into the property game? Well, when I finished my business degree, I really didn't have much of an idea as to what I wanted to do. I went uh, went over to Europe for a few months, um, you know, in a post-study sort of indefinite holiday, and I came back and I happened to know the um, the sales manager, the city sales manager at CBRE. He was um, a guy that was a boarding master. I came down, I, I was brought up in the country, and I came down to Brisbane to boarding school. This fellow was, um, was a boarding master at that school, and then he went on to become um, city sales manager. So the introduction came that way and um, and he hired me um, and I really you know, learned about property from that moment onwards. I didn't have a predisposition to property through family or, or other experiences. It really came about through that connection. Okay. So then you had your first project building a commercial building? Yes. And what happened after that? Well, after we finished that, so this is like in about my second year at CBRE, uh, we realised uh, that we there are a lot of things we had no clue about in, um, in undertaking that project. So I thought I should get some development experience. So I went to work for a development company called CM Group. Um, and it was a Queensland-owned uh, company that ultimately got purchased by a Japanese company in the Japanese bubble period. Um, so I worked at CM Group for 12 months after my stint at CBRE and during that time um, our private interest, which we'd named Consolidated Properties at that stage, had secured another site uh, for another Westpac building. So um, the two careers were running in parallel but I did gain an invaluable amount of experience while I was at CM about just the processes that are involved in development. Um, and then at the end of that 12 months, I figured, you know, at the ripe old age of 23 that I knew everything, um, <laughs> as you do when you're 23 years of age, and thought I'd give it a go full time um, at Consolidated Properties. And essentially, I've done that continuously to this day. And so when you left and started on your own at 23, what were the things that you realised later on that you didn't really know about? Well, the whole, um, I, I guess, evolution of non-builder developers was happening at that stage. If you sort of think in a historical context, most of the developers grew out of building companies in, uh, in, in that era. So the first thing was to try and figure out how we could you know, properly participate in this market coming from an agency background rather than um, a development background. So there was definitely a learning curve there. Um, we felt pretty comfortable about doing the leasing deals. Um, there was no issue around that, but learning the delivery function was was a significant step up. Uh, also, learning the funding um, processes was a significant step up. So those first few years, um, as yeah, first early years of consolidated properties, were really honing our thought, our thinking, and our thought processes around those two two um, things: delivery and funding. And so what were you thinking as a 23-year-old in terms of where the business would go to? Oh, look, Justin, we've always been very curious. Um, we've always been very adventurous. And, um, and we were really 
you know, just there to enjoy the best ride we could. In the early days, we had an, an adage that the plan is there is no plan. Um, we were just there to see what we could do um, in whatever field of development came along. The core philosophy always was, though, to look after the occupant of the property. So our first projects were small uh, office buildings. We subsequently branched out into retail, industrial, um, apartments, master plan communities, you know, all of the different strains of development. But core philosophy was around if we look after the people that are occupying it, whether they be buyers or tenants, then we'll build a, we'll, we'll have the basis for a viable financial transaction. Yeah, I'm really keen to explore this trajectory or arc of how the company has grown and expanded over the years because obviously it didn't happen overnight, but moving from a, some small commercial projects to master plan communities and resorts and all these kind of things uh, is quite interesting. Are there, are there points along the way where you can remember thinking, right, we're going to start changing direction or we're going to go after the bigger projects? I think, Justin, we, we were always ambitious and one of the advantages or disadvantages of starting out at a young age is failure doesn't sort of really, you know, um, feature in any of the thinking. You know, you think, of course, nothing's going to go wrong. We'll all, all, always be fine. So, so therefore, we're always on the hunt for the next thing. There have been a couple of watershed projects in our career and the first of those watershed projects occurred five or six years after we started out. Um, the Commonwealth Government had a requirement for new Commonwealth law courts in Brisbane. And, um, and we, we literally, we read the ad in the paper and we started to cast around for a site um, that we might be able to submit to them. Uh, at, at that stage, and this is sort of the um, late 1980s following the demise of the share market in 87, all of a sudden we found a lot of our competitors just went broke. Coon Corporation, those sorts of groups that were players were no longer on the landscape. So it was a bit of a Stephen Bradbury moment for us that we were almost last man standing in the development field. So we were able to take advantage of those difficult um, economic circumstances and I, we were able to option up an, an entire city block um, in, in Brisbane and we were able to engage the best architects, which at that stage was Petalthorpe, and the best constructor at that stage was a company called Concrete Constructions, which had just come off building Parliament House, into our team. So they really didn't have any other option other than to back this new start. So long story short, we were able to deliver for the Commonwealth Government a $130 million, 33,000 square metre building um, on an entire city block in Brisbane that incorporated some very unique financing as well. We had, because the government didn't have any money, we had to fund it into the land acquisition, which we did, developing a securitisation piece of their obligation to pay, uh, which again was unique at the time. Um, so that took us from doing projects that were up to $10 million, all of a sudden jumping to $130 million. That was a really big step up for us, and that then gave us the credibility to pitch for really whatever size project we wanted um, in, the, in the Brisbane market from that point onward. So very significant project for us. That was a game changer, uh, which happily occurred very early uh, in our careers. It sounds like a massive jump. I'm very curious about your mindset at that point in time in terms of why you decided to go after it and what gave you the confidence to tackle it. Well, I guess, Justin, it, it is when you're that age, you only see the upside. You only see what's possible. You don't see really what the downside is and you don't, you know, um, you don't have the, I guess, conservatism that comes um, with age. Some say knowledge might be a better word than conservatism, but but we, we definitely never had a moment's doubt that we could put that project together. Um, and then when the, um, the Attorney General announced that we were the successful candidate, we were over the moon because, as I say, it was a complete game changer for us. 
the law courts is a hundred year building, like it's a building that's built to be um, in the market for a hundred years. It's a substantial piece of social, um, uh, it's a social asset. It was a very important project in terms of Brisbane as well. So um, we were very, very keen to do it. And as I say, luck panned our way. Our competitors dropped off, the site became available, the capital was available, uh, and the Commonwealth, um, our idea resonated with the Commonwealth. Uh, a very important project in our career. And so how old were you at this stage? So I was negotiating that when I was about 26, that sort of age, and like basically knew nothing as well, too. That's the other thing. Um, <laughs> Honestly, you're saying you knew nothing, but you negotiated a big deal. <laughs> it was a big deal, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I look back on it and think, wow, I must have looked like a baby coming to those meetings. But um, one of the other things, Justin, we've learned over time is that nothing is really complex. I mean, people make things out to be complex, but the, the principles that drive transactions are almost always very simple. So one of the things we did on that transaction, we focused on the simple pieces of commerce um, and we could see a way home by doing that. I mean, clearly we didn't focus on how the engineering of it would work because that was done by the consultants and the builder. Um, and, and that's another thing that we believe very strongly in today, that nothing is too complicated. You just need to think about the simple commercial principles that drive a transaction and look to closing those out. Can you just expand on it? Sorry to interrupt you. Can you just expand on that, that comment where you said you saw a way through on the transaction and you followed that through? So using the Commonwealth Law Courts specifically as an example, yeah. we could see that the Commonwealth and the judiciary wanted to be in this location and ours was the only site in that precinct. So we knew that we had the right land, we had a tick there, and we believed that we needed to have a very credible team in order to deliver because we didn't have the personal experience. So being able to co-opt um, concrete constructions, which a modern comparable to concrete constructions would be someone like Multiplex, ProBuild or Hutchinson's. That's the modern version of that. And so we had a large tier one builder which could underwrite our promise of delivery. Um, and we brought in experienced architects, quantity surveyors, uh, project managers and the like to oversee the delivery. So in terms of our promise around delivery, the principle, the simple principle we had to pursue is how could we convince the Commonwealth Government, a very conservative customer, that our team could deliver? Simple answer, get the best people uh, in the field. Um, so having the site and a, um, and a delivery team that was believable were the two really big principles of getting this transaction to work. Obviously, the third piece then was getting the feasibility to work. Um, given that the Commonwealth was going to buy it, so they were the funder and the end takeout, it was a case of making sure the feasibility included everything and that the risks were boxed. And, and something, Justin, we might have to talk about is our philosophy around risk. Um, during this discussion, but we were able to demonstrate to the Commonwealth that risks had been identified and, and sold down. So those are the simple commercial principles that drove the transaction, and we were able to demonstrate them in a confident way and in a simple way that the Commonwealth was easily able to sign off on. Oh, that's really good. Uh, we, we will come back to risk. Um, I, so what happens after that? So you secure the project, it gets successfully delivered. What happens to your thinking and your mindset or your view of the company and the projects it can do after that? Does it get bigger or what happens next? Definitely gets bigger. I mean, we've been on a constant trajectory of growth since those since those very early years, 40, nearly 40 years ago. Um, so our thinking, not in, in a planned way, but in an opportunistic way, was to say, well, what other things do we want to do? So we'd, you know, we'd done a big commercial building, we'd done some industrial buildings, we'd done um, some high street retail. Residential was obviously the next thing to expand into. So we, we started that um, 
process by doing a small block of apartments, 20 odd apartments. You know, we learnt about the, the rhythms and the opportunities and the pitfalls out of that. Um, and our next sort of, I guess, game changing project emerged out of the experience we gathered in those small apartment projects. That next game changer for us was Casuarina Beach, which was our first master plan community, which is um, on the uh, in northern New South Wales. Um, that project came about um, through um, a, a consultant of ours, a town planner, identifying this site as a site that um, was potentially available for development. So the background to that site was the uh, Barclay Brothers, Barclay Construction. Barclay Construction ultimately got sold a number of times and its current iteration is Lang O'Rourke, which is a major contractor in Australia. They bought this land, which was ex-sand mining land in the 1960s, had spent 20 years buying out sand mining leases and going to court to get uh, a court-approved development approval for a new community. Um, at the time the, the, the site was identified for us, I, I went and met with Don Barclay and said, you know, um, you've been at this for a while, would you like to sell? Um, he said, yes. Uh, said, would you like to make an offer? I said, well, you know, it's 200 hectares. How do you feel about $5 million? And he said, I would feel better if it was $50 million. So clearly we were a little bit apart uh, on our pricing expectation there. And again, long story short, we um, we ended up closing out a transaction at a bit over thirty million. Um, but again, we brought to bear some creativity around the financing, and we said to Don, "We'll pay the ticket price, but we need you to reinvest back into the project um, with some structured debt." And that, that, coupled with some time on the contract for us to get pre-sales, is what enabled us to settle the acquisition of that site and undertake the first stage, which would then see all of the capital recouped. Interestingly, the first stage was the largest ever first stage subdivision done in Australia. We had, um, I think from memory, in one stage, 200 lots. It was delivered by Hutchinson's, which were just beginning their sort of growth trajectory. They hadn't done a big subdivision before. Um, and it was financed by a syndicate of ANZ and Westpac. So, yeah, the funny thing is, looking back on it, developer that hadn't had done one before and a builder that hadn't done one before managed to convince um, two of Australia's leading banks to finance the biggest uh, one-stage subdivision done in the country to that stage. So we, we were able to successfully complete that. And, again, that was a real game-changer for us because it opened up all of the land market as possibilities and we learned how to do complex mixed-use projects like master plan communities through that. So that gave us um, another area we could expand ultimately nationally in that, in that sort of field. And so how did you go about convincing the banks to give you that money? I'm sorry, Justin, could you just repeat that question? Yeah, you said you'd managed to convince the banks to back you, even though you had no experience and the builder had no experience. So how did you manage to do that? Well, again, we, we looked at what the risks were and we said, Hutchinson has a strong enough balance sheet to underwrite the delivery cost. Um, Colliers, in its previous form, PRD, had got enough pre-sales to underwrite uh, the debt repayment piece, and, uh, and we had all of the necessary approvals in place to enable the project. So we said to ANZ and Westpac, clearly you can see the delivery risk is underwritten and you can see the sales risk is underwritten, and we have enough equity through a combination of our money, uh, the vendor um, finance facility provided by the Barclays and some external capital to satisfy those requirements. You're, you're, both of those banks were looking to expand their presence in that market. It was a good big transaction to do. So we ticked the boxes for that reason. I mean, these sorts of things happen at certain points in the cycle when everyone's looking for growth. Every, people are, like the banks are willing to take those sort of risks. If you tried to bank that transaction with those set of parameters today in this market, the, the Hain inquiry dominated banking sector would run a million miles. But that was a, a good period to be doing those things.
and, uh, and we're able to get it off the ground. So when you're talking, when you talk about having a creative approach to financing or structuring deals, I mean, where do you learn something like that? Were you having conversations with people with more experience, or were you just throwing ideas out there and hoping they would stick? It's really a combination of the two. Uh, and again, just uh, I just sort of think of these things really simply. I try and sit myself in the other person's chair, in this instance, the bank's chair, and what would I want to have to give this person money? Like I spoke just before about the Casuarina project, delivery risk underwritten, um, sales risk underwritten, approvals in place. You know, if I'm a banker, I would think with the right amount of equity, that's probably a transaction. I then, I guess, put myself in the equity provider's shoes and say, well, what would I want to invest into this project? And I just sort of think of things simply. And what the equity provider wants is some certainty around getting their money back and an adequate return for the risk. Um, so it's pretty easy then to start narrowing the decision focus down. You know, what is the return um, and, and what are, is the risk coverage? Um, having said that, then, we've always engaged professional managers around uh, managing the equity piece. You know, we currently have relationships with um, CBS Lane, we have relationships with Qualitas, which are two professional managers. So they then provide the in-depth knowledge around structuring those pieces. But again, it's, it's the simple commerce that drives them. Okay, then what's the next big project that comes along? So for us, um, the next big thing was shopping centres. Um, and again, this came out of that period when, and this occurred around the same time as the, as the Master Plan Communities Opportunity. The crash that came inevitably after um, the boom that started after the share market crash, I'm talking now about the early 90s, saw a lot of shopping centre developers go to the wall, but there was still a requirement for shopping centres around Australia. Um, so we were presented with a portfolio of opportunities by um, the Buchan Group, which was an architect that is, was and still is very dominant in, the, in that sector. Um, there was uh, one at Lismore, one at Port Macquarie, one at Springfield, one at Orange and one at Bathurst. And they said, look, you know, we can, we can take you on the journey of how these things work. We were able to find um, a retail leasing consultant that um, gave us competence around the leasing piece for these shopping centres, and the vendors of the land were prepared to give us time to get everything lined up. So the next, I guess, seminal change for us was shopping centres, and it was around that portfolio. We were able to package that portfolio up and then on-sell it to Macquarie Bank, which was floating... Um, the Countrywide Property Trust, which has now morphed into the Charter Hall um, retail REIT. Um, so we were able to cotton, uh, um, piece together the portfolio, the takeout and the delivery. Concrete Constructions again did the delivery for us. Um, and that gave us a really strong start in retail. As with our other streams, we are still doing shopping centres to this day in that same market. And were there other projects that started yeah. happening or you started getting to resorts and industrial? Yep, so, so the other product lines um, we, we went into sort of really came out of that master plan community space. Casuarina needed um, a couple of resorts to satisfy the, um, the tourism zone. So, I, again, we developed those um, using the strata title sale model of selling the rooms off, uh, and the main wearing resort was the first one we did at Casuarina. Um, and that has given us an ability to do short-term stay type accommodation, which we're still doing. Um, we then had a whole series of interesting business-related uh, projects we went into. Again, we needed restaurants and gyms and things like that at Casuarina as it was a startup, so we we started and ran those businesses within those projects um, to get them up and running. So we, we had some experience then with that. That list is pubs, as in hotels, gyms, um, uh, adventure companies, a whole raft of those sorts of businesses. Um, 
which we did and ultimately we sold pretty much entirely back to the staff that worked in the businesses. One of the things, Justin, we came to the conclusion of is that we didn't want to be in the business of actually operating those types of businesses. We wanted to be in the business of collecting rent from those um, those tenants. And that, that philosophy really continues to this day. If we have to, we'll establish a business, but we really want to get as quickly as we can out of that and, and be just a landlord. Okay. And are there any other bigger projects or watershed projects or turning points from from there? So I suppose the last in that list, so just, just to sort of recap, you know, we started off doing small office buildings. We learned how to do major office buildings through the Commonwealth Law Courts. We learned how to do shopping centres through that Macquarie Countrywide portfolio. And we learned all about residential through projects like Casuarina. But the last on that list um, really was operating as a public company. So in the lead up to the GFC around 2006, when the market was um, pretty frothy, we took part of the consolidated properties business and glued it on to a funds manager um, called Trinity and listed that company uh, in 2006. Um, that company ran successfully until uh, the GFC hit and like everyone else in the property sector, we were battered by that. Um, so we had life as a public company for a few years. When we saw that it wasn't going to, uh, it was going to be a pretty difficult period, we rationalised the public company. I bought back the consolidated properties business and we sold the funds manager um, to LaSalle and that forms LaSalle's uh, base business in Australia now. So we learned how to operate in public markets um, and, and that's something that uh, is on our distant horizon for the Comsprop business um, still. Um, you know, we've had the experience and we may well do a public offering of some sort um, down the track. And what did you learn from that period in the GFC when the company got battered? Look, the, the main lesson we took from that is that you need to identify your problems, address them, and do it straight away in an open and transparent manner. The, the key, I guess, example we had during that period is that we had um, quite, amount, quite a significant amount of debt through um, Bank of Scotland. Um, Bank of Scotland was ultimately wrapped up into Lloyds Bank and Lloyds was bailed out by the taxpayers of Great Britain. Um, we had to refinance that debt. Um, none of the local major banks would refinance it. So we ultimately sold the assets and did and bought our own debt back through an asset sale process. So the lesson for me on that was if you've got a problem, own up to it very quickly and aggressively address the problem so that um, so that everyone can move on from that problem. Don't let it linger um, because it will get much, much worse. Okay. And then what's the key difference between consolidated now and when you're a smaller developing business? Well, I think the main thing, Justin, is we are much more narrowly focused. I mean, this morning I've spoken about us being a restaurateur, a gym owner, um, doing small office buildings, we've had car parks, we've had retirement, we've, we've had a go at really everything across the spectrum. Um, coming out of the GFC, we made a decision to focus on two key areas of the business. Um, half of our business is commercial retail and the other half is residential. We don't have any of those peripheral uses in our portfolio at the moment. So I think the main difference between then and now is we're much more focused in two areas and we're looking, for, we're delivering a much larger portfolio than we have ever previously delivered in those, only in those two areas. All right. And so for developers out there who are thinking of growing their business, in terms of how they would structure the business and the kind of roles they would sort of look to bring on along the way? What are the what are the key people or the key roles that you think a development company should have? I think the first thing is, Justin, there is a very wide group of consultants that can help deliver a project. So 
you know, I don't think you necessarily have to have them in the house. You don't need to be the builder, you don't need to be the architect, you don't need to be the engineer. What you need to focus on is the ability to generate an idea, that is, what's the project going to be? That's the first part. And then you need to be able to successfully manage all of the component parts, many of which are outsourced, to deliver that project. So for developers starting off or, or looking to expand, my advice would be focus on the idea. Um, remember that you are, or we are, a consumer-based business. Without our customers, we don't have a business. So focus on your customers and focus on the idea and then make sure you have another group of people within your business that can manage that idea because generally speaking, the guys that can think up the idea can't manage it and the guys that manage it won't be able to think up the idea. So you need to have those two skills in-house. But if you're looking to expand, you've got to have those opportunities and you need to focus on finding them then delivering them. And you touched on this before, but in terms of the challenges that you faced in the beginning against the challenges that you face now, what what do you think they are? Look, when, when we first started, capital was freely available and throughout most of our career, um, the debt markets have enabled developers to fund basically 100% if they want to. Um, that is definitely not the case now. Um, development is all about equity and development is all about strong long-term relationships with capital providers because capital is scarce. Debt and equity is scarce now. And um, so the business is much more focused on running a model that is lowly geared um, with high equity components. And that, that equity will be largely outsourced so the reporting and um, the responsibility around delivering for equity is much higher. So there's, there's a much more detailed, sophisticated approach to, that, to the funding component than there was in, in any period um, of the 40-year career. And so how do you maintain that equity base if you're looking to expand? Because don't you have to keep tapping into it? Okay, there you go. Part one of my chat with legendary developer Don O'Rourke. There was so much gold in that discussion. And there is so much more to come in part two, where we talk about how you can structure your developing business for growth and also discover one of the most expensive lessons Don has paid for. And I actually have sitting in front of me um, a framed check and sits on my desk and it reminds me every day about a very valuable lesson. That check is for $200,000, and there's a plaque that sits underneath the frame check, which says... So make sure you tune into that when it drops. Here are three things I took out of what we have talked about so far. One, be ambitious and curious. Don mentioned how he was always ambitious about growing the company, and curious about exploring how deals could be structured. There are many creative ways to structure deals, so why don't you start exploring what is possible? Don said he was getting advice from people he knew, so why not go looking for creative ways that could get your next deal off the ground? 2. Manage risk through partnerships Don talked about how in their Casuarina project they offset some of the risk through effective partnerships with the landowner and builder. And on the Law Courts project, they partnered with more experienced consultants to offset their inexperience. And this is good advice. If there is a part of your project that needs bolstering, then try searching for somebody that can help strengthen it, whether it be finance, planning, selling, or construction. Three, try to keep things simple. I like how Don said he tries to keep things simple. And he does that by trying to put himself in the shoes of the person on the other side of the transaction. This way he can find options to make a complicated transaction simple. For example, with the Law Courts project, he knew the government preferred the location of the land they had, and he just needed to work out how to satisfy the other things they wanted. By working on keeping it simple, he has grown a massive business. Okay, that's it for part one of the discussion with Don O'Rourke from Consolidated Properties Group. If you are enjoying this conversation with Don, then go back and take a listen to episode 15, where I speak with another Brisbane-based developer, Shane Hiscock, about his rise from IT guy to full-time developer. 
Shane has been partnering with investors to help grow his business and shared this insight into how it works. The stuff that we're doing now, we help people get into a project, sell one of the two properties out. They're left with a property that's got a really low LVR with a strong cash flow and then they're therefore ready to go and do something again straight away. There is lots of great stuff in that chat with Shane, so delve into the archives and enjoy episode 15. Don't forget to email me if you're interested in learning how to become a property developer, justin at propertydeveloperpodcast.com. And check out my Instagram and Facebook pages for my latest developing videos, photos and news at Property Developer Podcast. You can also find all the past episodes of the show over at propertydeveloperpodcast.com. So until next time, may you be bold, ambitious and curious with your developing career. You've been listening to the Property Developer Podcast. Tune in next time for more tips, ideas and inspiration to take your developing to the next level. For more developing love, make sure to visit propertydeveloperpodcast.com. You've been listening to the Property Developer Podcast. Tune in next time for more tips, ideas and inspiration to take your developing to the next level. For more developing love, make sure to visit propertydeveloperpodcast.com.